Uh, <clears throat> it's good to see so many people online. I, I hope you're all uh, all well with in uh, these very strange circumstances. And uh, it's also good to see that people read our mailing lists and can react at very short notice. So, <laughs> so apologies for for that. I, I hope it wasn't too confusing as far as dates and whatever was going to happen. Um, but uh, we felt we needed to do some more hacking remotely and then we felt that uh, it would be good to get everybody on the same page before one of these virtual hackathons and then we thought okay if that's the case there might be other people interested in what we're going to talk about anyway and hence an email us on Friday so it's it's very nice to see that uh, still some other people can make it uh, could make it so thank you all um, I don't think I really need to give you an introduction on, on Synergy or so uh, at all. Uh, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, <clears throat> what we did think it would be useful to start off with uh, a brief reminder and, and not uh, update really on the status of our two bits of software. So uh, just uh, for clarification, we are going to have contributions from and, and hacking from <clears throat> the two different CCPs. So uh, a CCP Synergy is, is concentrating on emission reconstruction and MR, while uh, CCPI is concentrating on X-ray and neutron and other uh, modalities, uh, mostly for material sciences. But because there is a lot of overlap between those two, we try and get our, our software talking to each other as much as we can. And in particular, the core imaging library CIL is something that uh, uh, Surf, which is the uh, Synergy software, is using for uh, algorithm development. And so that's what we're going to use in, in this week's uh, virtual hackathon to try and investigate what, what uh, other things can we do but while the underlying basic modeling and so on sits in serve for our case. Um, so um, if, uh, if that makes sense to you guys, then I think we can go ahead and have a, uh, again a brief update from uh, the serve side from Evgeny and then one from uh, on CIL from Eduardo. And um, I think it's probably best that you keep yourself on mute as everybody's doing at the moment. But um, there has to be, yes, there is a raise hand facility, which you might find if you get the participants uh, up on, on the right of your screen. There's a raise hand over there and then we'll, we'll try and, and watch it. And if uh, you want to ask a question, handle it that way. Does that make sense? If so, uh, let's go ahead. Uh, and I think, uh, Evgeny, can you uh, share your screen and see if that works? And obviously unmute. Should I take uh, the um, PowerPoint presentation, which I put on, on that place? Yeah, if you, I think it's probably best if you share it. Okay. Um. Right. Or, or or somebody else on on Evgeny's behalf if that doesn't work. Evgeny, would you let me to do it for you? Or would you rather oh, share it yourself? Yeah, if if you do, please. <laughs> um, sure. So is it in the in the SharePoint, is it? Yeah, yeah. It's served progress since yep. seventeen twenty five. Yep, I can see. <laughs> And just start. Uh, I am. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, th this is a shortened version of uh, the list of things we've done since uh, our previous release, uh, which uh, happened 
quite a while ago, back in November. Uh, uh, well, f first of all, we are now Sinner B, and we had to uh, replace all occurrences of PetMR in our uh, code with Sinner B. It was a daunting <laughs> technical task. Right. Uh, one of the major breakthroughs since last release is that now we have uh, a nifty pet projector uh, owing to which we now can uh, do forward projection uh, in store using GPUs. And I understand that accelerates things, uh, well, significantly. Um, uh, next uh, big step is that we now can convert ISMMRD images into nifty image data and as I understand, this is not something I work with, but I understand from Richard that uh, this is probably the first conver such converter. Am I right, Richard? Yeah, yeah, you oh. everything, sir. So. Yeah. Uh, well, the next items become more and more technical. Uh, frankly, I believe Richard would can tell you more about all these adjoint transformations and things. But okay. Let's not get too deep into details. I um, only have five minutes. Um, we have some new methods in Nifty Resample class. Um, we added um, image data processor to pet acquisition model, and this allows us to do some things like, well, I don't know what PSF is, but <laughs> right. uh, we can resample complex images. Uh, we do a, we can do SPM registration. We uh, provide support for multiple floating images and we, uh, the user can set store verbosity from his or her Python script. Uh, store images can be saved uh, with the help of parameter file and so user can, for example, save images as .nii, it's in the image format. Um, well, cannot really say anything about next item, sorry. And of course, we have a lot of fixes and additions to our documentation, also bug fixes and stuff like that. So that, that's a rough idea what is happening, what has happened since the last release. Yeah, thank you. So just... Um... For clarification for people, the, the Nifty PET projector uh, <clears throat> that we're using at the moment is only uh, wrapped for the Siemens MMR. I don't really know how flexible it is for other cylindrical PET scanners. Um, there are a few things that we had to hardwire and we haven't we haven't tested it for, for anything else, so that might disappoint you. Um, obviously, yeah, I, I don't know, Richard, if you want to give rough uh, runtime for a full projection for a full uh, a full synagram using this. Oh, and it has to it has fixed image dimensions as well. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and another limitation of it is that we're currently not capable of doing a projection of part of the data. So using a subset. Um, but that said, we think that the, I mean, a forward or a backwards projection is sort of the order of 10 seconds. So we suppose that um, a projection of the full data tends to still be faster than a projection of the subset of the data, um, even with sort of a nice open MP set up on a, with many CPUs on a computer. Uh, that said, we th there may be um, a bug in that projector, so I think for the purpose of the hackathon, we may avoid it, um, especially given the fact that Edo's set up a nice 128 core CPU machine. Um, but it is useful, I think, for, for debugging uh, your code. If you need to get through many iterations quickly, then it's useful. But um, I think that there might sometimes artifacts in the final image. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm, we're not 100% sure if that is because we wrap it wrongly or, or if it's something in the GPO code itself. And I think Pavel obviously... Uh, well, it's, it's, it's for another time, but I think it is in the, in the nifty pet code of creating an issue over there, but that's uh, oh. by the way. 
great. Well, not great. I mean, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but I think it's because they um they can if they do their own OSCM reconstruction, they just leave everything on the GPU and they do their recon their reconstruction that way. And so I think relatively very few people use their projector where it starts on the CPU, they do a projection, then they copy it back onto their CPU. And so I think there's a bug in that one because it's not actually that widely used. Most people just use their OSCM reconstructor, which is a different implementation. Makes sense. Thanks for that. Good. Any any questions from uh, the audience on any of this? Uh, if not, uh, thanks, Veni. Um, so, Edo? Yes, I will uh, share my screen which I suppose you're seeing now. Yeah, so fine. Okay, so this is an extremely quick update on what's in the CIL uh, release um, from, so um, we tag with uh, year and month of release with respect to um, surf, so it's a bit different. Um, I think with respect to the last uh, software meeting, we were at 19.10, so it was the version we had at the symposium. Right, so just uh, to summarize, I think these things were already uh, mentioned by uh, Chris, Alicia, sorry, my daughter. At the other armadio. In camera mia. Sorry, my daughter is here. <laughs> Homeschooling is not easy. Anyway, so uh, Chris mentioned that CCPI um, is more aimed at um, material science. <laughs> Alicia, stop it. Ah, I agree. Uh, sorry, so uh, we have software in CCPI dealing with Alice, basta, non, non posso parlarti ora. Non lo so. Sorry. Um, uh, so, basically, we have software for many bits and pieces during the CT rec uh, pipeline from pre processing to visualization. And the CIL is just a bit of software that we've de developed recently. Um, that deals with pre-processing and reconstruction. Uh, it is made of two parts, one framework, which is very similar to SURF, so I'm not going to talk about it, uh, where we define image data and acquisition data, and geometries, which are, say, descriptions, metadata for them, um, and a package which is um, dealing with optimization. So we have other objects that do um, well they allow us to write um, optimization problem like this so uh, our mathematicians they like to write these things and then uh, they like to define um, an algorithm to try to find the minimum of uh, your uh, data set so what you acquire your um, uh, data that you acquire and a solution that tries to uh, say minimize a sort of difference between them and in in iterative algorithms you have um, a function an objective function uh, and then you, you normally have a prior knowledge or you try to apply a prior knowledge to your solution so that it it is more regular so you avoid overfitting probably uh, and in the CIL we have a number of ingredients to write this uh, optimization problems we have a number of functions um, we have a, a number of regularization uh, functions as well uh, and we have a number of operators which are um, object mapping from the image uh, data um, to the acquisition data. Um, this may be projection operators, like from, um, yeah, to, from the image data to the, the acquisition, but it might be 
something different. Um, this is to say that we are very similar to SURF. This is a, an image taken from the SURF article. Uh, basically, the CIL wraps an engine for the forward and back projections uh, for CT, which is Astra. We are trying to put efforts to wrap uh, other, other engines like Tigre. And we have basically all our software is written in Python. We don't have this uh, middle layer. Uh, but but the, the objects in Python are, say, fully compatible with service uh, objects. So we have a number of algorithms to solve um, this um, minimization problems. Here it's an incomplete list, but we have classical iterative methods, CGLS, CERT, gradient descent. Uh, we have FISTA and PDAG. And in this uh, virtual hackathon, we would like to develop SPDAG, so this uh, stochastic version of it. Um, the changes that have happened uh, between 1910 and 2004 uh, are mainly in the function class. So we have now uh, added algebra for functions. So you, if you sum, sum or subtract functions, you get you get a function. So you can still use it as a function. Uh, you can also sum scalars, and you have the same. Uh, you can multiply it with scalar. We added a translate function so that if you can, you, if you have f of x, you can shift it by calculating f of x minus b, and you don't have to explicitly say it. So and we have constant function. Um, we, on the operator side, operator for us is similar to what uh, in SURF is called acquisition model. So we have scaled operator. So if you multiply an operator by a, a scalar, you get an operator. Uh, or something that behaves like an operator. Uh, you can add operators uh, and you get something that behaves like an operator. And we have operator composition. So you can say chain uh, operators one after the other. So here is an example of a composition operator for uh, that Richard, I believe, is using in, in his um, um, motion compensation. So he has the acquisition model AM and the resampler. So he resamples the data to one single uh, motion state. And the acquisition model is different in each motion state. And this behaves like an operator. So you can change. So here is, there are two, but you can change more than two. So how many you want. Of course, speed is not a uh, great feature, but it does work. So um, and additionally, we have what we call block framework, uh, something if this flexibility we ha you receive now, it's not enough. We have a, a something more to add. Uh, so a central uh, thing is the block data container, which is a, a raw array, say, of data. It can be image data or, or acquisition data or a mixture. Uh, we have block functions, which uh, represent a separable sum. So if you have a number of functions uh, and a block data container, you can do f of x, where x is a block data container like this, and you get the separable sum. And we have the block operator, which is basically a block matrix with operators inside. Um, so this uh, star would would represent, say, that the application of the operator, so the direct method of the operator on this block data container. Uh, there are some restrictions. So the column have to have the same domain. So the operator in the column that, have, that must share the same domain and operators in a row share the same range. And why would you want to do this? So all these things come from the documentation. So I just... Uh, screenshot it. Uh, so basically, if you want to write uh, an, an optimization problem like this, this would be a denoising with TV regularization, as I think, um, with list squares, a data fitting. Um, well, you now can write it because we added the plus, I think, this, this uh, addition to functions, but we, we weren't able to do it in 1910. 
Um, but this can be rewritten if you write a function, instead of a function, you, you write a block function with the, the norm, this norm here, and list squares here, and an operator, which is a block operator with gradient, nabla, and the identity. And then you write your uh, image data here. Then you, if you write f of k of w, you actually, if you do your linear algebra uh, on paper, then you will get this one. And the interesting thing is that if you pass, if you substitute the identity here with the projection operator, then you get a reconstruction with regular gradient, so TV regularization with least squares. So this is all the flexibility we get um, with, uh, with, so Vagelis, I suppose, has got a million other uh, usages of the block framework. Uh, he probably also will tell you something later. Uh, if I have uh, a couple more minutes, uh, I'm gonna tell you about the algorithms. Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, here we have how it looks like in Python to write this. So it's pretty easy, you, the gradient identity block operator block function. So for algorithm, um, if you don't object, I'm gonna talk about it. Uh, what the, the whole idea is that you look into algorithms and you find this stuff and I, it's very difficult to bring this uh, into software. So the idea that we had was, we want to make this step easy. Um, and so we created something that enables you to write quickly an algorithm and also get uh, something very nice. You can see how uh, the algorithm is iterating the objective function if it changes and stuff like that. So for <clears throat> PDAG, we have also primal and dual variable we can show or not show depending on some um, parameters that you pass. So this is the idea. Um, basically an algorithm is an iterable class in Python. So it means that you have defined next. So whatever is, you can pass it in a for loop and it will iterate. Um, just to show you what are the important bits. Uh, first of all, there is a method that stops the iteration. Uh, you can modify it. There is a pre a def a default version that is just saying maximum iteration reached, but you could uh, add whatever rule you like. Uh, then there is the update. Update means it's actually one iteration. So the user has to define should stop and update. And for Wait, instance, if you if you were doing yes, can I ask you how do you uh, use should stop? Is it a keyword argument? Um, so should stop is predefined as maximum iteration. Uh, you you could change the function. I think in this in currently it's. You, you need to substitute the function itself okay, to okay. return something. So it's it's not very well uh, implemented. Yeah. Um, so this is an example for if, if you were doing gradient descent, uh, the update rule would look like this. So you have your solution, the rate. Uh, so you update your solution by the uh, multiplying the gradient of the objective function by the rate, and, well, by minus rate. Um, and then there is another thing that the user has to uh, define. So in gradient descent, for instance, this would be just the evaluation of the objective function on the current solution. So here there is also some re remnants of uh, a previous error. Well, but anyway, so these are the, the main ingredients that uh, when you develop a new algorithm, you have to uh, make sure you uh, develop uh, and a setup. So you need to save rate and objective function with some names, but basically it's very simple. Um, we have a branch in our system uh, in the CIL dealing with stochastic or better said uh, subset algorithms. So algorithms that operate on subsets. Um, it's, a, it's a inheriting from algorithm uh, it's a little bit different in in the next, so in the 
a single iteration because it it will iterate on all the subsets and will ask will ask to uh, iterate uh, update the subset and what update subset does is just take uh, takes um, the count of sorry takes count of what the current subset ID is and update it if needed be here. Yeah. Uh, update the epoch, which will mean that all the subsets have been uh, processed. And but the algorithm doesn't know anything about subset. Doesn't know. It just will say when, once it's finished one subset, it will just say to the relevant um, structure, "Well, give me another subset." Uh, so we, we, which one is the relevant structure? This has to be defined by the algorithm itself. Uh, so in fact, this is not implemented in the in the main class. Uh, so this is again stochastic gradient descent. Uh, it's basically a gradient descent. This is the whole implementation. It, the only thing I had to change was the notify new subset and the notify new subset has to say to say to the objective function that the new subset is required. Now then, the stochastic gradient descent has done its job. It's your job is to define an objective function that can that implements this and and handles it correctly. But this is the idea um, we had. Yeah, that's it. Um, and I have a quick question on your stochastic gradient descent. Um, yeah. Are you saying that your objective function has to do the random choice of the subset? Um, um, no. So the way, we, so this information is uh, incomplete in a way because um, the, the, so what we do, we have uh, a data container which can handle subsets. So um, we have so far, this is all in, in a branch, so we can discuss, but basically we have an object that defines what are the subsets. So you, you'd say to this, uh, to this object, oh, give me out of this data set, give me 10 subset with, I don't know, uh, random subsets, so it would be stochastic or uniform sampling or staggered, whatever uh, rule you want. And then uh, the acquisition data will take care of uh, updating the algebra on that subset. So if you do algebra on a subset uh, data container, then it will happen only on the subset. Um, the objective function needs to, uh, so for instance, for gradient descent, if you pass, if you want to do reconstruction, you will, you will have a projector. The projector will have to know that the new subject, subset is uh, coming. Uh, so it has to update. I don't know if I have, um, let me see. I should have an example, should I? Uh, but I don't know. Uh, let me see. Maybe I've got it here. I think this one will be right. So this is the projector that um, implements such. It, it updates the 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 project the projector itself to project only the the the, the subset. Where is it? Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's here. So the the the, the least squares then says okay, says B is the da the data tells the data it has to to change subset and then notifies the projector that the new subset is coming. And how this happens is inside the data data container. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I I guess we can go over more detail later with the relevant people. But um, so the the idea here is that 
I didn't want the the algorithm to know anything about this. It's just it's just saying give me something else, and we need to make sure that this gets to the algorithm. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, but um, I guess at at the moment your stochastic algorithm is cycling through the subsets. It's not stochastically yes. Yeah, this depends on how the su the subsets are selected, right? Right. So I I didn't impose any choice on the on the selection of the subsets. Uh, you c you can actually so for instance for gradient descent is pretty robust. You can pass anything in, in whatever order and it will kind of converge maybe okay. faster or slower, but it will converge. Fista, for instance, I've noticed that it can't handle stochastic uh, or non-staggered, say, or the subsets, basically. It really depends on the algorithm, but you can do anything. So that, that's the idea. We didn't, I didn't want to say, uh, you can only do stochastic. And I'm not sure, but, okay, I mean, just very quickly, at, at the moment, then you seem to say it's the objective function operator that needs to know about what subset order to use and so on, which might make some sense, but not for a stochastic algorithm. Yes. So uh, your, your class at the moment is, calling, is called stochastic algorithm, but it, then you should have a random selection of the subset. Yeah, yeah, you're right. In fact, in the title of the, the slide, I said subset algorithm, which probably is more accurate. Right. Okay. It, yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with stochastic selection. It, it just operates on a subset. So, so sorry, Edo. If you would like to have it to be stochastic, you would change here your code in update subset, update subset, isn't it? Because here you just go to the next, but you could just uh, choose it randomly. Yeah. Right, but um, it depends on how you create the subset. You can, can I don't, I don't, I'm not entirely sure how you would do it, but if you, um, if you would create them randomly, can you, can you create them beforehand? It, does it have any sense or it doesn't? Uh, yes, I guess it does. Um, and then you just choose a number of your subset randomly. I mean, that's a way of creating random subsets. Yeah. 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 Um, yes. But it's not, it, it's not your client class that should know about it. It's your optimization algorithm that the stochastic version of it has to take care of that. But anyway, it's a, think, okay. Well, this is a discussion for the hackathon in fact. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I wanted to, put things already yeah, yeah, no, it's in great. the field. Really helpful, thank you. Okay, uh, any other questions for Edo? And sorry for the interruptions of my daughter. She really wanted something. Uh, right. Okay, if not, uh, thanks again. And uh, um, I hope uh, Vangelis can share his slides or if not, yes. yeah, great. Uh, uh, how do you want to handle questions? Uh, can, can you see my screen? You can ask me when I'm speaking, after, whatever you want. Well, no, it's up to you. Yeah. I don't have a problem. Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> I will talk briefly about the primal dual. Uh, uh, Hang on, sorry. But Vigelis, earlier I could see your screen. Now I see black. Does anyone else see the same or is it just me? Yeah, I also see black, yes. Uh, maybe I don't know, come out of full screen and go back in again or something. No. Now I can see it. Yes. Don't know what happened when you go full screen. Let's see. Can you see yep. my screen? Yep, okay. all good. Uh, so, okay. Uh, 
add also some here the, the, the equation that we want to solve. So this is the general formulation of the minimization problem that we're going to solve. So we have x and y are finite dimensional spaces. K is our linear operator, can be the gradient operator, the uh, self operator, the astra operator, the degree operator, and then all. And f and z functionals have these uh, properties are convex and loss and continuous. And I go from x to this and from y to zero to infinity. So some classical examples is, for example, with uh, total variation and the L2 norm squared of a u minus g, or uh, or uh, total variation with uh, a coolback liable uh, fidelity term plus uh, a uh, positivity constraint. So Z here is our acquisition data. Uh, a is a, the regularity parameter in front of total variation and A is a projection operator. So, uh, the PDHZ algorithm is uh, solves non-convex optimization, uh, non-smooth convex optimization problems, and the, it has this saddle point uh, structure. So, if you start with the the primal problem, which is the problem that I show, show you before, then you can find uh, after under some assumption the you can describe the dual problem. So in a way, the, in the primal dual algorithm, you solve these two problems alternatively. And we say that uh, the solution of this saddle, pro saddle point problem of min max, x star and y star, is a saddle point. And if it's a saddle point, then x star will be the solution for the primal problem, and y star is the solution of the dual problem. I will show you next some examples where we'll use uh, total variation. And a way to uh, check the convergence of uh, the algorithm is using the primal dual gap. So as Ed so showed before, we have the two, objective, the two objectives, the primal objective and the dual objective, and we subtract. Uh, in theory, it should be uh, larger, uh, or equal to zero, but in practice it may be a negative, but uh, if we iterate a lot, it should tend to zero, it should convert to zero. So, okay, uh, in the algorithm, we have uh, to initialize, we have two, pa two parameters to initialize. We have this tau and sigma, what are called step size parameters and we need to compute uh, the operator norm of k that will satisfy this condition. So uh, in some cases k can be computed analytically, for example when we have k is the gradient, we, we know what's the, uh, the operator norm of the gradient. For the uh, projection operators we use the power iteration to uh, approximate this uh, operator norm. So the updates uh, is, so we, we solve the, prim the primal and the dual uh, problem in the PDHC algorithm. So the first one is in terms of the dual variable y, and this is a gradient ascent. And the second problem is with respect to x, which is in the primal variable and is a gradient descent. And at the end, we relax, we have an over relaxation step with respect to the uh, to the primal bar, yes. Now this uh, notation is a simple, uh, just a, a minimization problem. It's called proximal. So you the proximal of uh, sigma uh, of the f star uh, evaluated at y is this uh, argmin problem, and the same for uh, a tau g. Uh, the basic assumption for the PDHD is that this problem should be solved uh, easily or uh, we can compute it uh, approximately in a high precision. But most of the cases, this is a one line uh, uh, solution. 
in our algorithms. Yes, so in practice, uh, when we have sig sigma and tau, the step sided parameters, we choose them, for example, one over k, one over k, norm of k. So they will be, they will, sorry. So they will satisfy this condition. Uh, but uh, it's not very easy how to find this optimal parameter sigma and tau. And there is a trade off between how, uh, between the primal and the, the dual residual. For example, if we choose a large tau, then we, uh, we minimize strongly the primal variable and we, uh, uh, we have a slow maximization in the dual variable y. Also, in practice, in our cases, sigma and tau depends on k. k is, up, is computed uh, approximately with a power iteration. And when we have a large operator norm, we have a slow convergence. And uh, there are some alternatives to... Uh, to Sorry, Vigeta, can, I ask, can I ask a quick question? Yes. When would you get a large norm k? Like what, what determines having a, you say if you have a large operator norm, you have slow convergence. I mean, in, in our case for the MCIR, uh, we have a very large uh, operator norm. I think it depends on the size of your data on your uh, uh, voxel size, detector size. It depends on the geometry of uh, your operator. Okay. okay. I was just wondering, I don't know if there's anything that we can do to control it. I don't know, say to minimize the norm and therefore get quicker convergence. To, to, uh, no, uh, in our case, we cannot compute it analytically. So we'll have to do this trick with power iteration. But that sure, that's that's to calculate it. But you say if it's large, you therefore have slow convergence. So my question is: Is there anything we can do to decrease it? No, I think it's a value that cannot be altered. I think. Okay. I mean, I if mean, we change the geometry of the setup, for example, it would change. Ah, okay. Right? Yes, yes. If if you if you play around with the geometry, if you decrease the voxel size or. Your, position data size, then yes. Okay. Uh, okay, we have some alternatives. Uh, for example, uh, if we have some convex properties on these two uh, functionals, then we have an adaptive update of sigma and tau and we get better convergence. Also, uh, we can, uh, another option is to monitor uh, the primal objective and the dual objective. And at each iteration, we would like to uh, update sigma and tau so the primal is close to the dual objective, so the difference will be close to zero. Uh, of course, it's, it's uh, stochastic PDHD. And uh, in the same fashion is the preconditioned PDHD, so we replace tau and sigma by two uh, symmetric and positive definite matrices. Uh, so this is the again the P, uh, PDHD algorithm with sc scalars tau and sigma, and then we replace tau and sigma with matrices, and we have a similar condition that we want to satisfy here with sigma and tau, and the proximal uh, or yeah the subproblems have a similar proximal. So instead of before, we didn't have this sigma here. Now we have another definition for the L2 norm. So it's a weighted L2 norm square. So we have this sigma uh, to the power of minus half. The it's, sigma there is a matrix. Uh, it's not, sig it's not a, sum, a sum. Sigma is a matrix. Yes. And yes. Uh, there are uh, many uh, choice of uh, precondition of how we're going to select tau and sigma. So the easiest is to do this uh, uh, diagonal preconditioning. So tau is the diagonal matrix and sigma is the diagonal matrix of uh, vector sigma and tau. So tau is, you take 
you take your k, where k is your uh, operator, take the absolute value, you raise to the power of some parameter here, and you take the sum over the columns. And you do the same for the sigma, the sum over rows. And this will give you a diagonal matrix with some coefficients of the k operator. So uh, when we're solving the PDHD algorithm for this particular uh, minima minimization problem, so we have the total variation, the regularization parameter, we have the uh, kullback of fidelity and the positivity constraint, and we want to transform it into this form to apply the PDHD algorithm. So K now, uh, it's called explicit PDHD because we, uh, we, f we split fully the, the, the problem. So every subproblem is very easy to solve uh, as a closed form solution. So K is the gradient and A is the uh, operator, the projection operator. G is just the positivity constraint and Sigma tau are scalars. So F will be the sum of this functional and this functional. And if you apply F of K of X, you will get the first two terms, and then you will get G of X, which is this one. So the proximal of uh, tau of G will be just this uh, threshold for zero values. And if you take If you take the, the, the proximal of uh, the conjugate of uh, F1, you will have, again, one closed form solution here. And the proximal of uh, this functional is, again, closed form. So you have this sigma here, which are scalars. And if we do preconditioning, it would be the same in terms of uh, uh, development. Uh, the only thing is that we have to multiply before we had sigma. Now we have to multiply with uh, with an array, eta, for example, or uh, This is the uh, explicit precondition PDHD. Now we can do, ah, okay. Yes, in terms of uh, coding in uh, seal, we defined gradient, we defined the astra operator. We block, it. we block these two operators and we call the block operator. And when we have a block operator, we, have, we need to have a block function. Block function is the, this function, the separable sum. So you take one function here and one, another one. And you can compute the, the operator norm, K, and you can define sigma and tau to be the, your uh, scalar parameters. And you can set up PDHC. And yes, uh, another uh, way to define, uh, to set up PDHD in this case is not to, uh, not to take, uh, not to split this uh, gradient U. So in, in, in this case, K will be your operator. G will be uh, the total variation term plus the indicator function and F it will be your KL uh, divergence. So again, we have one solution for the for this sub problem in terms of the fitting term KL divergence. And in order to solve the problem, the proximal uh, uh, operator for G, we need to we have this uh, minimization problem, and we use uh, this. Uh, fast uh, gradient projection algorithm, the FIST algorithm for TV. And again... Uh, uh, so, sorry, may I ask a question? Yes, yes. Yeah. So this means that to, to compute the proximal operator, uh, I mean, at each iteration, you do a sub-iteration to have uh, your proximal operator? Yes, yes. Okay. So, the, 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 yes, exactly. For this a problem, we, we have, it's not, it, it doesn't have a solution. We need to iterate inside, uh, so we have a PDHC algorithm and we have an, uh, a sub-problem that it calls another algorithm. So we have 
outer iteration and inner iterations. Okay, thank you. And, and, and typically, how many uh, inner iterations are needed? Very, very good question. <laughs> uh, it depends. You have to play with your parameter A and the inner iteration that you use here. I mean, uh, it depends on the, on the on the problem. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the setup for the implicit preconditioned PDHD. Uh, so we don't have a sigma and tau to be scalars. We can have uh, sigma uh, one over k uh, of uh, the ve of vector once in the space of x one over okay this is k adjoint it's a typo of one over y so we can do that because in practice k is a positive operator and we don't need to take these uh, absolute values here uh, but yes and the the prox the the solution for equation seven Instead of sigma, we have again uh, sigma to be uh, an array. And tau here, capital tau, is again acting on this fitting pin. So this is the, uh, the code if we want to decisioning or uh, not precondition. So it's one over this k adjoint of ones, k direct of ones. And F is the uh, kullback library fidelity. G is your uh, total variation term. And tau and sigma can be selected are the or matrices or uh, scalars. And I prepare uh, 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 Jupiter. So this is uh, this is our noisy sinogram, and uh, we we're doing the explicit PDHD. So we have the block operator and the block function. A norm which represents the TV term. And okay, I did it with the L two norm square instead of a KL uh, fidelity term. Now uh, sigma and tau are uh, scalars and we can get this uh, reconstruction and we can try another setup for sigma and tau before it was uh, one over norm k now it's one and one over sigma times norm k squared we get pretty much the same reconstruction and we can do again this uh, implicit PSD. so now we don't have a, a block operator or a block function we have k is your uh, is is our projection operator, and uh, the inner iterations for the uh, FGP TV uh, algorithm is uh, are one hundred, and we can uh, we we have sigma and tau to be uh, uh, scalars, again the same type of solution, and. If we want to do preconditioning, uh, we have tau and sigma one over k adjoint of one, so k direct of ones. Again, pretty much the same solution. And this is uh, comparing for the four cases, the primal dual gap. So you can see that when we have uh, the standard one over k, it's the one over norm k goes like this, but for better uh, convergence, the implicit preconditioning is uh, converges faster. But okay, there is no there is no big difference between the no precondition and the precondition for this particular example. And I believe that well, okay, it's log the, scale, right? So. Yes, yes. Yeah, so, but I'm I'm almost certain that uh, SPDHZ will will win all these four cases. But so, uh, what, what, 
so the PDH gene, no preconditioning, implicit, goes to a gap which is lower than the implicit with preconditioning. Are you happy? You mean, uh, yes, after, uh, I don't know why we have this uh, behavior. Uh, probably there is a bug on how we compute some of the um, uh, convex conjugate of our functions, of our indicator box function. Because when we compute the actual uh, uh, primal dual gap, there are some uh, functions, uh, functionals that will be either zero or infinity. So uh, we need to we need to take account for the infinity case. So it, it should be always zero. I believe but, you. Oh, no, no, I, I, it's, I have to fix it, <laughs> basically. But your, your expectation is that it goes way below than that value. It actually seems to be mirrored or something. The bl the blue and the no, I mean the orange curve seems to go very uh, much down and, and then hits boundary and then it's re reflected. Yes. Uh, yeah, I I don't know. Okay, thank you. Shall we uh, maybe? continue those discussions in, in detailed sessions later on. Yep. Uh, I just had a, a question on the preconditioning. So at, at the moment you used things with uh, taking the norm of K in your preconditioner. But do you think that in principle you would want to think about the similarity function itself as well? Because I could imagine that you want to have different preconditioning if you use a least squares or a, or a KL distance. Uh, what do you mean the similarity? I, I, I don't understand. So your, your sigma and tau that you use at the moment, uh, you compute them in terms of K? Yes. And in your preconditioning as well, k dot one and so on. Yes. So the, in this way, in the in the preconditioning, there is no uh, we we can avoid computing the or, or approximating the operator norm. So in these cases, we don't we don't worry if uh, we took ten iterations for the power iteration to approximate the operator norm or hundred or five hundred. Yeah. But I'm I'm asking: Is there in in uh, you know gradient-based preconditioning? You would also think about the uh, similarity metric. Y yes. When you design your preconditioner. What is the similarity matrix? The metric, the metric. F in your case. So I'm, I'm wondering if that's something that in PDHG is, is applicable or not at all. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't think so, although... I mean, that's... So... Uh, uh, yeah. So... You, you, you're asking if uh, F here has something to do with the preconditioning. With the well, precondition. at the moment it doesn't, but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if... I, in, in, I, uh, I don't know, but I, I can say that definitely this, this uh, diagonal precondition is the optimal. So the, there is an, uh, there is there there is a paper that says that uh, this will not work 
very well. And actually, if you try solve it with FISTA, it uh, has a slow convergence. Okay. Anyway, maybe for a discussion. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, one quick question about what yes. you just say, Edo, if I if we have the time. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so you, you, you just say there was a paper saying that the uh, this preconditioner uh, wasn't expected to be so good in the case of uh, implicit PDHD. Yes. And that's with comparison to explicit PDHD or with comparison to, to something else? So this is, this is a paper. Uh, it's acceleration of primal dual methods by preconditioning, I think. Uh, Utah win uh, and they say that uh, oh, but the one you 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 put online on the um, on the vacaton page uh, I don't know probably yes I I, I sent to Chris two papers yeah. one was the uh, the standard that this one okay and the other was this one okay okay but the, this is a paper goes uh, the authors compare the solution of the preconditioning algorithms with the with a cvx solution and to me that's that's amazing and for example uh, they have the PDHD algorithm, the standard one, uh, it takes 3000 duration and the diagonal preconditioning uh, with FISTA, I think it takes more. But this is for uh, denoising. Okay. And I think, uh, okay, this is for, for tomography. Yes, for example, for tomography PDHD, it's, Three, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank thank you, Angelis. Um, thank you, Chris. Um, more discussions, I'm sure, to come later on. Uh, so, Claire. Um, yeah, I will share my screen. Yep, great. Thank you. Um, at least. So just one minute. Yeah. So do you, do you see my screen? Yes. Uh, yes, okay, wait, thank you. You, I should. Do you still see it now? Oh. No. no. No, okay, I, I think that's a presentation mode. It doesn't work with Zoom, don't really know why. Okay, so uh, I took the same notation uh, than Vagelis, so uh, I, will, I want to uh, introduce again the notation. Uh, so I just, uh, just want to begin uh, to talk about the motivation for stochastic PDHD by, uh, I mean, a very simple comparison between PDHD and uh, the clinical standard in tomographic reconstruction, which is uh, OSEM. So uh, that's just a PDHD algorithm. And we see, for example, uh, in the um, uh, here K uh, is the choice of the explicit PDHD, but actually, so at each iteration, 
you need to compute the full forward and backward projection. Uh, so when A is a ray transform, uh, that's very expensive to compute. And if we have the implicit PDHD, then K is only A, the ray transform, so it's, it's the same problem. Okay. So uh, with comparison, what uh, OSEM uh, does is to um, uh, divide our operator, the ray transform A, in um, uh, a column of operators. So we can think that we can divide all the angles in subset of angles and each AI corresponds to a subset. Uh, and then if we look at the update rule, uh, we only uh, update at each iteration uh, the variable corresponding to one subset. So uh, obviously it means that uh, each iteration is much less expensive to compute than one iteration of PDHG would be. Um, but uh, we lose uh, the everything which is so nice with PDHG. So in OICM, there is uh, no prior and uh, no um, guarantee of convergence. And uh, I mean, a lot of very well-known uh, issues. So uh, the idea of stochastic PDHG is to uh, basically it's to put uh, subsets uh, into PDHD. So let's see how we can combine the structure of PDHD, which is based on this uh, primary dual structure, and um, a separable structure when I can uh, separate my um, my forward and backward operators in. Um, partial operators, let's say. So uh, the first line here is just the um, traditional uh, primal dual uh, whiting of the problem. And now let's assume that I can white my operator K. Uh, it goes from X uh, to Y, and uh, I will just define uh, sub-operators, which are common, like key one goes to y1 and so on and so on and so the full operator k goes into the cross product of uh, y y1 dot ym okay so uh, if we look in the first line the operator k it's um, it comes inside the term where i also have the function f so the function f also, I should assume that, she, uh, that it's uh, say parable. So here, that's what we are assuming, but sorry. <clears throat> but f is separable, uh, which means that it's a sum over all my indices of a function f y applied only to uh, y y, not to the whole y. Okay, so uh, just to comment uh, briefly, that uh, typically uh, this separable structure is the case for data fit terms. So uh, but, but that's the thing that makes it uh, interesting. If you think, if you think about kullback libler or, um, or just uh, uh, square norm two uh, data fit term, they will uh, satisfy to this assumption. So now what happens is that uh, when uh, we want to white our problem in the primal dual space, um, this is actually compatible with the separa separa separability structure. So uh, here I can white my, my primal dual problem as the sum uh, of y from one to m of each um, scalar product and then the um, convex conjugate of just one function fy and my function j. Okay, so uh, basically that's the structure which allows to, um, 
to define uh, the stochastic primal dual hybrid gradients. So I will just describe here um, by comparing it uh, with PDHD. So uh, this version of PDHD, uh, it's slightly different uh, from the one that Vagadis presented, because here I, um, I made the choice to begin with um, the gradient descent on the primal variable, so after that, I have the gradient ascent on the dual variable, and my extrapolation step is on the dual variable. And we'll see in a minute why I want it that way, just to compare with SPDHD. So uh, in SPDHD, um, well, the first step is the same. I have a gradient descent uh, in my primal variable, and then, I will choose uh, one index y with a probability pi, and uh, I will update only uh, the corresponding i's um, variable. So here, instead of doing this for every i, what, uh, that would be the case of PDHD, I do it only on the y that I just randomly chose. And uh, the extrapolation step on the dual variable, crucially, uh, in the uh, extrapolation parameter, which uh, it's not theta anymore, but it has to be theta divided by uh, pi, the probability to, we, to which one shows is the index. So uh, that's why we wanted to have the extrapolation step on the dual step size to be able to have this division, um, which ensures the mathematical correctness of the algorithm. So, um, going back to uh, our motivating example, here we see that uh, for in one iteration, we have only, um, a partial uh, forward projection. But uh, as it is written right now, we still have the full uh, back projection. Well, actually, uh, there is a way to uh, uh, rewriting uh, this step to show that we only need the partial uh, back projection uh, in this case. So that's just uh, a small um, writing of the, um, of the preceding uh, steps. So what we see is that here, uh, when we want to compute this thing, we only need to compute uh, the back projection on the coordinate y, but we should have kept into memory uh, this quantity. So it means that in SPDHD, uh, we have to store additionally uh, this uh, K star Y bar K. So that's, um, that's the same memory requirement than, uh, the, than X. Uh, I mean, we are in the image uh, space. Claire? Yes? So for, for every, in the... Uh, So the k star y bar k. So in both steps, we don't need the k star. We only need uh, ki, right? I mean, we need k star uh, uh, for the for the primal uh, when we update the primal variable, right? Yes, but yeah. you uh, in the other slide, can you go down? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, we need here. We need the k y star. Ah, K, okay. I mean, we, uh, I mean, it's, uh, in any case, we would need uh, K on but, K star. Yeah, yeah, but only for the subsets. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Only for the subsets, but that comes at the cost of just keeping this object always into memory. I'm just updating it subsets by subsets, which isn't complicated. Uh, I just want to say that uh, it adds a small memory requirement. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, so, okay. Uh, so, uh, under some condition uh, on my parameters, so like PDHD, SPDHD converges to the saddle point of the primal dual problem. Um, so what are these conditions? So here we should have uh, that uh, the extra extrapolation parameter theta should be one. Obviously, uh, we have to select all probabilities um, with a strictly positive probability, we cannot uh, never pick a subset or uh, variable C if this wouldn't work. And then we have a condition uh, which is similar to uh, the one of PDHD. So, um, SPDHD also works with preconditioning. So in exactly the same fashion that uh, Vagelis just explained, here, instead of having a proximal operator which involves a scalar tau, I can now have um, a matrix for uh, tau, which I will call T now, uh, as, it's a, as it's a matrix. So um, that's exactly the same algorithm, but just now with um, matricial step sizes. And um, what are now the conversions condition? Um, well, uh, the original conversion condition is this one. And recently, we uh, actually realized that uh, we can take the exact same condition uh, that already appears in uh, Park Chambol uh, for uh, PDHD. So uh, here I would define my uh, sigma matrix, which deals with the dual subsizes, just as um, uh, a block matrix of each uh, each step size for the for the sub problem. So uh, just let us see uh, in practice uh, what uh, we can choose. So um, <clears throat> here I wanted to write it in a general fashion. So I took uh, two uh, parameters, which are uh, um, I don't know, to be calibrated somehow. So uh, rho, uh, actually, uh, I just take it to have something which is uh, strictly less than one. So typically, uh, I will choose uh, 0.99 or something. And uh, gamma here, uh, it controls the, um, uh, the balance between uh, the primal and the dual step size. So it controls uh, the trade-off between progressing on the primal problem or progressing on the dual problem. So, um, how easy is to uh, find optimal parameters for this gamma and rho? Yeah, uh, I mean, rho, I think we don't need to, to optimize it. We just put it as close to one as like numerically. Okay. And gamma, uh, I, I don't know uh, about. Um, I don't know, mathematical method to choose it. Um, but what we tried to do, and uh, it worked, uh, was to uh, take um, a reconstruction problem which with the phantom, which yes. would be very close uh, to what uh, real data should, should, uh, should look like. Okay. And then we tried different gammas for this phantom and we checked that it's uh, the best gamma that you see numerically. It also actually is the best gamma or close to the best gamma for uh, real data. Okay. But that's more, more a numerical uh, approach. Yeah, thank you. But this is when you, your data looks always the same, like in yeah. pets. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. exactly. 
And I mean, to, make, to, to be sure that this kind of numerical approach uh, works, uh, we should actually test it on a bigger variety of real data, which we do, don't have for the moment. But I'm not sure it can be a constant of the scanner, for example. Um, so yeah, uh, we can have like uh, the scalar sub sizes. Uh, so you see that for the dual uh, step sizes, uh, it's, it looks like very close to uh, what we're used to in PDHD. And for the primal one, it's, it's just uh, taking the sum over the norm of each uh, partial projection AY. And then uh, uh, we have the preconditioned pre diagonal step sizes. So here uh, I can take each matrix sigma i as a diagonal matrix and on the diagonal uh, I would put uh, this weight. Uh, so here I have a different weight for each k. And then for tau, that's the same thing. And uh, additionally, I mean here, here am I um, in this uh, for the dual um, variable for the dual step size? Sorry, um, I'm summing over columns, and for the primal step size for to, for tau, I would be summing first over rows, and then over each y where y are um, the number of subsets. Uh, I and mean, basically, this is uh, just a way of rewriting what are the um, uh, poc chambol preconditioned diagonal matrix uh, with the notation that A uh, is decomposed in A1, et cetera, AM. So A will be the, the projection operator. Yeah, uh, oh, I mean, uh, part of, but uh, as, I mean, I will explain in just uh, one minute that A, it can be the projection operator, but it can also be uh, augmented with a gradient, like in ah. the PDHD. Okay, yeah. So, uh, as you said, if AI has non-negative elements, then obviously uh, it's better uh, not to compute uh, these rows because we should have access to every uh, element on the matrix, which sometimes isn't very practical, but uh, we just get it by applying um, the forward or the backward uh, partial operator to the, um, to the one element. So uh, just to conclude on this slide, what about a case where uh, I have multiple a, Y, some of which have non-negative elements, uh, typically the, um, the projection uh, operator, and some of which have, don't have this uh, property, like the gradient, then uh, as uh, in this notation, uh, if we A, I is um, separated from the other, I can take the nice formulation uh, when uh, it's available, and if it is not, I can go back to this uh, less uh, pleasant notation where I have to explicitly sum over the absolute value of each element of the matrix. Um, so, uh, yeah. How would this work uh, for tomographic reconstruction? Yeah, I, I put pet reconstruction because that's what I'm working on, but obviously um, uh, this would work for uh, tomographic reconstruction in general. So uh, I want to uh, write my problem as uh, a collection uh, in this separable framework. So uh, I will consider a partition of all angles in N subsets and call A, Y, the forward projector corresponding to this A subset. And then uh, for the data sheet term, so here I have the callback-Leibler callback divergence. 
and I will consider the sum only uh, on the bins, which uh, pertains to a line, line of response um, where the angle belongs to my, a, uh, my subset number i. Um, so in that way, my uh, here, uh, traditional problem where I have uh, here the uh, data fidelity term in the kullback libler uh, divergent fashion. Here my uh, TV uh, regularization term and here my um, positivity constraints. They can be uh, rewritten in uh, the following fashion. So uh, the simplest one to identify is J. So J corresponds to my uh, non-negativity constraint on the, on the image. And here, the number uh, of, um, of sub-problems uh, I have, uh, in this case, it would be my number of subsets plus one, and the plus one, it just corresponds uh, to the gradient term. So uh, for each physical subset, so to say, um, my, my partial forward operator is a reduced um, forward uh, projection operator, and I defined Fi uh, as, as both. And then just the last uh, component, well, uh, the operator would be the gradient and uh, the function, uh, the last function, it would be uh, my um, uh, L1 to norm with, uh, I, I just forgot the alpha here as a typo. So, uh, but the uh, SPDHD equivalent of the um, explicit PDHD that Vagalis just presented. And um, question uh, now is uh, how to choose the probabilities. So um, there, is, there would be a natural choice, which would be to say, okay, uh, so I have M sub problems, so I will just take one over M, like the uniform uh, probability distribution for, uh, for each, um, each value of PI. But actually, uh, we realized uh, that it's better to give uh, more uh, importance to the update uh, which respects to the regularization term. So here, a good choice, I mean, um, like numerically, uh, a good choice is to take uh, one over half for the regular for the probability which corresponds to the to the regularization term, and then uh, uh, one over half uh, for the physic for the forward projection in general, and then for each sub projection we just divide uniformly inside this. So this means that uh, uh, in mean, the algorithm uh, spends half its time uh, updating something which corresponds to the regularization term and the other half updating something which corresponds to the, to the data fit term. Um, any questions? Uh, uh, in the beginning, you mentioned that you uh, do first the uh, uh, the primal ascent and then the yes. dual. Yes. Why is is this uh, change of, yes. of the order important? Uh, it's important because um, for the algorithm to be mathematically correct, to in the, in the proof of convergence, we really use that here. We need to uh, divide the extrapolation step but this factor pi. And um, this works because my extrapolation step is uh, on the dual parameter. 
Okay, so maybe let me let me say it uh, a little differently. Will, will it work numerically if you uh, have the order of PDHZ? I understand that uh, probably I mean, with, without the PI, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, I haven't tried personally, and I'm not sure whether uh, I don't know. Um, so you t you're changing the order in order to prove mathematically that uh, this converges. Exactly, but Will I think it, in PhD it, it, it shouldn't matter. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't matter. But if you don't change the order, will it? Uh, do you have a proof of convergence? No, uh, no, no. We, we we really use this. Okay. Okay. But may maybe it's true, I don't know, it's just not proved. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I have a great question regarding the regularization stuff. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, can I just check you can hear me? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, good, just making sure. Uh, so with your regularization and how you have to have that probability as a half, does yes. that kind of indicate to you that actually Okay, so the sub concept of using regularization is, as a subset is interesting to me, but as you found, it's the algorithm seems to perform better with the uh, with it as a subset. But is there any way to to not have it as a subset and incorporate it into your update? Uh, sorry, I'm not. Oh, yeah, I mean, we, we could do um, uh, so. Uh, this is the equivalent of uh, like explicit PDHD, mm -hmm. but we could also do the equivalent of implicit PDHD, which would mean that here um, I could take into J the um, TV term. Yep. Right? So if I take into J the TV term, uh, then uh, that's just dealt with uh, in the primal. Um, in the primal update. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, uh, well, we don't have an, any explicit, uh, explicit expression from, for the proximal in yep. this case, because J is a sum of two things. And yep. we need to, to, to use another uh, inner loop algorithm as, as Vagalis explained. Yeah, so I'm just wondering, because you found that it goes, that half, a probability of a half of the penalty seems to be a good choice. Yes. It, it kind of seems like it's tending towards you almost it, the algorithm se seems to like having the regularization done very frequently and yeah, exactly. every yeah. update might yeah. be better i don't know i was just wondering if it was investigated yeah well totally uh, yeah it's very good very good remark uh, totally worth investigating yep thank you uh so Besides the regularization parameter, you, you need only to tune the number of subsets, right? This, um, is, your, this is your only hyperparameter. To, to we need tune. to tune the number of subsets. And uh, we also, if we want, uh, we can take a default of gamma to be one, but then we ah. can also leave it here. And if at some point uh, it's useful to, to, to be able to manually tune it. So alpha and gamma, yeah. Uh, alpha, gamma, and also we should say if we would prefer to have the scalar step sizes or the preconditioned one. Yeah, okay. Uh, if uh, I... Not one hundred percent sure. Maybe maybe you answered this one to Robbie as well. But so the uh, choice for taking uh, noise a uh, half the prob probability a half for the penalty. Mm -hmm. I could I could imagine that this is going to depend on where you are in your iteration schemes, uh, on how much information you need in the penalty versus what you need in the uh, similarity term? Yeah, so a question would be, uh, can we make the choice, of, uh, I mean, the probability distribution, can we make it adaptive, right? Right, yes. 
Yeah, uh, uh, it's a very good question, and I'm, uh, I'm also looking at it, but I don't have a, I don't have an answer at the moment. Sure. Yeah, sounds a really complicated question. Yeah, thank you, Claire. <coughs> Ada here. Um, so we, I noticed. Uh, I'm not an expert, but now I'm using PDH more often. So it seems that it needs to iterate for thousand iteration at least to mm. to see that the gap goes down and you have to tweak, tweak, tweak all, the, all the atals and sigma to get them uh, to converge. But so this this algorithm, does it need to iterate that much in terms, yeah? Um, but, but, or, but, but, but the point, you know, he, uh, if you took uh, enough subsets, uh, there is really, um, um, it's really faster than PDHD in terms of the number of epochs. I mean, so you don't need a thousand epochs? No, you don't. Uh, more like uh, 200, 300, I would say. So, so there is a speed up computationally because you compute the forward and back projections only on subsets exactly yeah and also the convergence is faster independently exactly yes okay yeah it's like the it, it i mean intuitively it looks like the algorithm doesn't need all the information at each iteration yeah so yeah so you have more time to feed around with parameters basically yeah. thank you welcome Uh, maybe I can jump on with one more question. It should be really quick. Uh, have you profiled the impact a number of subsets has on convergence on, well, maybe not convergence rate, but sort of numerical performance. Uh, so half one yeah. subset, yeah. two subsets. Um, yeah. So maybe I should, uh, I, I would like to show you in the article because I think, uh, they have uh, they have a great. Um... Oh, is this in the paper? Yeah, it's in the paper. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, in any case, I think we we do need to move on. Okay. Uh, but it's not the last uh, discussion that we're having on SPD SPDHE, obviously. So, uh, thanks a lot, Claire. Welcome. Uh, was. Really... So just let me maybe. It's just really one second okay. for the question of uh, the, the answer to, to Robert's question. Um, here uh, you see it's PDHG with respect to SPDHG with an increasing number of subsets. Sorry, Claire, um, I don't know if you're sharing a different screen now. Maybe you. Oh, saw. thank you. Uh, it's, don't you see my. Um, I just see your, your presentation. Okay. So. Okay. Do you do you see the article? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just very very briefly. Um, so here, this green curve, it's PDHD, and then SPDHD with an increasing number of subsets. And uh, what happens is that uh, the more you increase the number of subsets, the more the, um, uh, the faster is the algorithm algorithm up until a point, it seems to stabilize. Here you see that there is like almost no difference between 100 and 200 subsets. Okay, yeah. Yeah, what about it? Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, so now we're going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, I, I realize we are taking a little bit longer than we anticipated. Apologies for the people who are not uh, uh, planning to spend the whole week on, uh, <laughs> on all of this, but uh, well, I hope it was worth it anyway. So we're going to switch to motion correction now because one of the motivations for doing uh, looking into faster optimization algorithms is that once you start to do <clears throat> motion correction with multiple gates and so on, then 
computation times just take longer and longer. Um, so uh, we'll start with Richard, who's going to give us uh, an update on motion compensated image reconstruction. Um, yep, there you go, Richard. Yep, thank you very much. Um, I'll go over the basics really quickly because I think um, most of you know already. It's very similar to what Chris presented at the last uh, hackathon that we did as well. Um, and so, as you all know, um, motion will will uh, will cause uh, blurring um, and it will cause mismatches between any different modalities that you might be comparing, and you might end up with some banana artifacts. So, um, because of the movement of the lung, and that you can see in this image here, where um, just at the the bottom of the lungs uh, or the top of the thorax, there's a, a misalignment in the between the PET image that's being reconstructed and the attenuation map. Um, so uh, the first step in doing motion correction is to detect the motion. And you can do that through a variety of different ways. So you can use um, external monitors, you can use your MR data, uh, you can try and derive it from your PET data, um, or you can do a combination of, of the above. Obviously this is specific to PET MR. Um, and then once you have uh, detected your motion, you can then uh, put it into gates. So similar motion states will be grouped together uh, to try and maximize the amount of data that you have on, e on each point and minimize the motion that you have as well. Uh, so once you've gated it, and um, so part of the problem with, depending on your de detection method, you may know when the motion occurs, but you may not know how much it occurs. And so for that, you, there's different methods that you could use. You could, for example, um, treat each gate to be independent. You could reconstruct each gate and then you could register them and then you would get an idea of the, the motion between them. It's just one method for that. Um, but then once you do know what your motion is, so you've detected your motion, you've somehow got an estimate for your motion, you can then try and do some motion correction. And you can either do that by, um, correcting for your motion at the end of your reconstruction, or you can try and do it whilst you're doing the reconstruction at the same time. Um, and so the first one is often referred to as RTA. Uh, so reconstruct, uh, transform, and either add or average, but some sort of combination. And in that you'll have, in this case, G number of gates. You'll reconstruct each gate independently. You know the motion um, from some other um, pipeline. And then you put everything into the same uh, common space and then you can add it all together and get an image which hopefully has uh, better noise properties. So that's um, dealing with each gate independently. So that's sort of a, a post reconstruction um, motion correction. Or you can try and do a motion compensated image reconstruction in which you combine your, in this case now we're using N sinograms and N motion fields and sticking it all into the same reconstruction uh, optimization to get out a motion corrected uh, image. And, and so for that, you need to, uh, to put, put your motion into the, uh, into the system model. So here you've got your image lambda, which you'll warp uh, for the given motion fields for, um, for that gate. And you'll need to do the same for your attenuation map as well. Um, so that's how your um, projections will change. Uh, and then this is just an image of a comparison between motion correction on the left and no motion correction on the right. Um, again, you can see sort of the banana artifacts and you've got lower resolution, but it's probably harder to detect some of the, the lesions because of the motion. Uh, so when it comes to doing your, uh, your um, MCIR, we, so the top one is, is the RTA that I already mentioned. And then between methods two and three, you could uh, consider each of your gates to be independent um, for a given iteration. Then you could combine them uh, and then keep doing it like that. So you'll have, um, for as many gates as you have, you'll have that many um, objective functions and you're trying to maximize them all. Alternatively, you could just have one objective function 
and you're trying to maximize the sum of all of those objective functions. Um, so I think the third option is, is obviously preferable. Um, and so, so that was really, really briefly um, MCAR in PET in general. And currently we have um, three ways that we're playing around with MCIR inside of SURF. And so this, is, this isn't any of the RTA, uh, so the uh, reconstruct, transform, and either add or average type methodology, um, because I think you can, that's relatively easy to implement yourselves. Um, and so this is for the MCIR stuff. So the first one we have is using, this is all available inside of SURF, but the first one uses STIR functionality um, to try and do the MCR. The second one uses the CIL functionality. So that's uh, a lot of what we've been talking about. You know, Edo mentioned some relevant bits, Figueres mentioned some, some relevant bits, Claire's re mentioned some relevant bits. And then the third point, which should hopefully be of some interest during the hackathon, is um, to do some MR, MCIR. Um, but the good thing is that can use uh, the CIL uh, framework as well. And much of the code is, is identical. So that's one of the advantages of, of using CIL there. But just to go briefly into them. Uh, so the STIR functionality, um, there's actually two objective functions inside of STIR that deal with gated acquisition data. And by acquisition data, I mean sinograms. So there are two ways of having an, a, a gated um, set of sinograms and incorporating the motion. Um, we, there's one in particular we're going to use, and that's because it uses the adjoint uh, for the motion, which is uh, more correct. Uh, and these two are actually, they live inside of two uh, PRs, uh, but hopefully, uh, well, we, they're, they're completely functional, so we'll be able to use them for the hackathon. And hopefully in the very near future, they'll be uh, in the master branches of both STIR and SURF. And for anyone who's familiar with uh, SURF, you'll recognize, you know, you set up all of your reconstruction in the same way as normal. Um, instead, you'll give the objective function as uh, the Poisson log likelihood uh, linear model for mean gated projection data with motion. And then you'll just add in your, however many motion states you have, you'll add in the sinogram that corresponds to it the actual model which corresponds to that and the transformation. And the transformation can either be um, a fine, so a transformation matrix, it can be a displacement field or it can be a deformation field. So the advantage there is that STIR has already been, um, is already capable of dealing with subsets of the data. So you'll use, it uses um, OSEM, uh, order to subset expectation, expectation maximization. Uh, and so it can be relatively quick. The disadvantage is that it doesn't have some of the fancy regularization that you might find inside of the CIL, um, but it is working. So then we've got the, uh, the CIL um, implementation. And again, the, the script is, is inside of the SURF repository. Uh, the advantage is there is that uh, we can use things like the preconditioning and we can use um, regularization such as the FGP. TV. Uh, and the disadvantage is that it requires many iterations, as I just said, and currently uh, there aren't any subsets. So that's obviously one of the things that we're really interested in looking at uh, in the hackathon. Um, but, you know, it's all very simple to set up and, and then to use. And then lastly, um, there's the MR implementation, which is almost identical as the previous slide. Um, so that's really good for in the future when you want to start um, mixing different modalities and um, and even optimizing different things, which I think Chris will touch on in, in his presentation. Um, just a, a word of warning, we think it's it's a work that it's, that's a couple of months old now, so it's not so fresh in our minds, but uh, maybe we'll need some work on the um, MR acquisition data, so the raw MR data. Um, but uh, I think that'll be some work for uh, people like Johannes, Christoph, and myself to have a look at over the, the next coming days. Um, so I think, I think that's everything I wanted to say. So um, I hope that was uh, in some way useful. And, and so all of the, the code is 
is online. I'll quickly show you just one of them. Um, I think, so this is the, um, this is the MCIR using the CIL um, implementation. And so you've got loads and loads of different options. You know, you give it a set of motion transformations um, and then a set of sinograms, a set of attenuation, a set of randoms, all those sorts of things. You can tell it to use different regularization somewhere. Hmm. Yeah, you can, well, okay, currently it's only um, positivity constraints or using the FGP TV. Uh, you can set the sigma and tau, uh, the alpha, if you are using uh, regularization. Here, Claire, you're asking about the number of um, inner iterations for the subproblem. Uh, by default, we use 100, but that's obviously something you can change. If you've pre-computed the norm K, because that stays constant for a given geometry, you can enter that and that will save doing the, um, the power optimization that Vigeris mentioned in his presentation. Uh, you can choose to precondition it if you want to. And then here are some, some things for accelerating it. You can uh, uh, rebin your pet data to make it smaller potentially, which will obviously make things a little bit faster. Ah, and then, sorry, if you want to, you can also normalize your data, which is something uh, that according to Vergalis will um, improve your convergence speed. Uh, and then afterwards, you know, you'll use things that, uh, that Edo mentioned right at the very beginning, things like um, the compound operators, composition operator, for example. So this is a composition of uh, an acquisition model. So that's what will do the projection from image space into sinogram space and vice versa, uh, and resampler, which will, you know, take you from one of your motion states maybe your common motion state into your ith, you know, or your jeeth, jeeth um, motion state and, and do the joint motion for that as well. And then there's uh, block operators and all those sorts of things. Uh, it currently has, uh, has the implementation of the preconditioning where it will overwrite some of the, um, the CIL functionality. So maybe if somebody wanted to spend some time on that in a hackathon, they could move that functionality. I think it's something that would be desirable for everybody. Move it from here into CIL itself. And that would simplify this script and also mean that that functionality is available for other people using it as well. Um, so I think that's everything I wanted to say on uh, our current state of MCIR with regards to PET. And Emma, uh, are there any questions? I have a question. Yep. So you mentioned in the disadvantages is that it, it needs to iterate, iterate, I don't know how you pronounce it, a lot. I, I remember you had other problems. Are, are those solved? So you think it's converging to what it's reasonable or there are other bugs? Um, I mean, I always have problems. <laughs> um, I don't know. So I've been messing around with a lot. I think recently the has found that if you used the one over one over norm K for both tau and sigma, he gets quite nice uh, convergence properties. I still have, um, so I'm running two optimizations right now. Um, this is um, using the CPU projectors. Um, so these are all of the, the arguments that I've used. Um, so I'm using eight gates of data. I'm using randoms, which I hadn't been used, hadn't used in the past. So hopefully that will improve things. Um, uh, I'm using 500 iterations. And then I'm doing some things to try and improve the speed. I've also pre-computed norm K and so that, and I can use one over, uh, yeah. one over norm K for both the sigma and the tau. Anyway, it's only a hundred iterations in, so it takes quite a while. It's taking about a hundred seconds per iteration. Right now, the primal and dual gap is, is pretty horrible. So, and, and this machine is, is 28 cores? This is the 28 core CPU one. So that's one that I'm currently working on. And then over here is the GPU one, and this has just started. Um, again, I used one over norm K. Um, and I think everything is exactly the same. I just thought that this one might go quicker. 
but I only launched it, I don't know, about 10 minutes ago. So I think it hasn't even got to 100 iterations yet. Okay. So anyway, the, the problem is that uh, there are so many things to vary and I'm varying everything, but I haven't really found uh, <laughs> something that works yet. And I also um, was working, I don't know if you can see here, using the STIR MCIR, um, and I still haven't managed really to get it to look better. So this is the RTA approach, and this is the current um, MCR using STIR. So I haven't managed to get that to look, I mean, I haven't done any, any smoothing here, but I don't think it'll end up with a better resolution than this. Um, uh, uh, what is the, can you show the histogram of, for this reconstruction? Uh, guys, I think I think we'll have to uh, okay, okay, sure. come yep. back to all of this. Uh, obviously, we do have to come back to it, but maybe not after um, our software uh, framework meeting has finished. So, okay. Uh, yep. <laughs> unless there is another quick question for Richard. No. Then I'll uh, talk a little bit on image registration. Uh, I'm only wondering which screen you're actually seeing at the moment, if any. We're <laughs> seeing your PowerPoint, but not the projection. Okay, right. Okay, um, so <clears throat> image registration is a huge topic which uh, is really worth a hackathon on its own or a software meeting on its own, but I thought it might be useful to frame image registration uh, for people who are used to image reconstruction and sort of try and show some similarities and, and differences. Um, so I'm not doing image registration any uh, real, uh, how do you call this? Oops, sorry, uh, worth. I, I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not explaining image, image registration very well here, or the advanced things that people are doing. So, um, image registration is generally uh, part of the motion estimation part, yeah? So uh, as Richard said, we can do the gating and then we can try and estimate the motion from gated images, or maybe we can do it during reconstruction as I'll briefly allude to at the end. Um, and then there are choices that you can make for which images you are you going to use for the image registration. And that depends obviously on which images you have available and you are also going to have to, to make some choices on what, what do you do? Do you have for head, it might be good to have rigid motion or for um, the body, you would have to no, do non-rigid and so on. So there's, there's all of these choices that you need to make and I'm, I'm not going to go into them. I'm just going to uh, give you this, the sort of the simple image registration problem first, where we just have a single gate, if you like, we have a target image and we have a, a image that has moved and we want to uh, estimate the transformation between the two. And I'm only going to talk about it in terms of optimization of an objective function. There are many other registration algorithms that don't use that framework, uh, but I don't know, know them as well. So um, I'm going to write it as an optimization problem where I have an objective function psi, which depends on three things really. So it, it's the target image. I'm going to write lambda for my images. Um, then there is the transformed image that needs to look as close as possible to the target in this case. Uh, so sometimes, uh, I'm sorry, that had to be a, a different, uh, a different lambda, obviously. Uh, there's going to be two images in the game. So uh, apologies for the mistake in notation. And then there is the 
transformation, which I'm going to uh, parameterize uh, using some parameters uh, alpha, which might be B spline coefficients, or it might be something else, um, depending on what your parameterization is. And then, uh, like in image reconstruction, we will usually have our objective function as a sum of two terms, a similarity term, which says my transformed image has to look close to my uh, target image, and a penalty term. And I'm not going to talk about penalties. There's a lot of work in image registration on good penalties, and that obviously depends on your parameterization. I'm only really going to think about the uh, similarity term here. So uh, aside from the fact that I messed up my notation that I need to have a different lambda for the target here, I don't know if I can do, I can possibly do that while I give the slide. No. Yeah, sorry. Anyway, you see some T's there for a target now. They're not yet in all places. Uh, so I think if you think about image reconstruction, the formulas that you've seen before is obviously my notation at the moment is different, but uh, it is similar in the sense that we have some similarity metric which now sits in acquired data space. So I uh, might be calling that Y and uh, we'll have a uh, image x that we need to estimate and there will be some four projection or acquisition model or whatever that it is that we apply on x to get it um, ideally as close as possible to the measured data and then we will have some penalty term there so mathematically there's i mean if i change notation x into alpha and i I change uh, y into lambda and I change f of x into the transformation of an image, then the formulas are exactly the same, yes? So uh, if you can do image reconstruction, you can do image registration, at least on the very first level. Uh, it, it won't uh, remain like that, unfortunately. Okay, so... Um, how are we going to uh, do the transformation of the image? So we have an image that we move around. And so normally we split that up into two steps. Um, first saying, okay, I have a parameterization of my transformation. And uh, I'll write that here as a deformation field model D. And so it's going, it's going to give me the deformation field corresponding to some uh, values of my parameters. Uh, and once I have that deformation field, that's sort of a, a dense field that says for every voxel, I know where the voxel came from. Uh, and now I can take an image and I can interpolate it I, or resample it according to that deformation. So they're, they're, they don't have to be two steps, but that's generally how how we think about it. We, we say, what is our deformation field and how do I interpolate my image given a deformation field? Now, uh, if you do B-spline uh, as a model for your deformation, things often get a bit confusing because uh, often the interpolation used for the resampler is also cubic B-spline and then we have two sets of splines around and you have to really be careful about which one you're talking about. Uh, there's another source of confusion potentially that the transformed image and the image usually has the same dimensions. It doesn't have to be, but that is how it usually is. That is never the case in image reconstruction. And so if you do image registration, you really have to think very hard about in which direction am I going to. In, in image reconstruction, that's never a problem because there's an image and there's a sinogram, for instance. You can never mix the two up, but in image registration, we mix them up all the time. 
So you, you just need to be careful there. Uh, now I have a third optional step there that says, if you do um, compression, then it, for many cases, makes sense that your image values actually change. And so uh, if you do CT and you compress something, your density will up, and so therefore your house values will change. And if you do PET, if you do compression, your activity concentration will also go up and then you need to take that into account. So that is not done by many people, but uh, it does exist. And sometimes people call this uh, mass preserving transformation or mass preserving uh, registration. If you try and estimate the alphas that, that do this kind of thing. So it, it is around in CT quite a while and in fact a few people have looked at it, in, including ourselves. So now we know how to do transformations, at least in in principle. Oh yeah, so that uh, we don't. Sorry, we don't. We don't have the last step in surf. We do have a transformation object that you can construct via B splines, and it will give you the deformation field. It's currently not written as an operator. That says uh, usually for a sample, for instance, you say resample dot forward to compute the operation. We don't have that in transformation at the moment, uh, but that would be quite easy to implement, I guess. Uh, we just have the object that encodes the uh, the whole operation. Okay, sorry, there's animation went a bit bonkers. Um, so if you do image registration, uh, we most of the optimization algorithms are gradient based that people use. I'm, I'm sure there are also people who don't do that and, and, and they might be using other uh, approaches, but I'm only going to talk about the gradient ones. And so in that case, for instance, if you do gradient ascent or conjugate gradient ascent or LDFGS or whatever you want to do, uh, those are very common choices in image registration. Uh, you need to compute the gradient of your objective function. And in this case, this is with respect to your deformation uh, parameters, the alphas. And so that will obviously be a sum of two things. It's the gradient of the similarity term plus the gradient of the penalty. Uh, and for the gradient of the similarity term, you can use the chain rule. So you can first say, what is the gradient with respect to the transformed image and then times the uh, gradient or the Jacobian matrix of the transformed image with respect to your deformation field parameters. Uh, so that is makes maybe uh, needs thinking about. You have, a, you have a way to transform your image. You need to see how does that depend on my B-spline coefficients, for instance. Obviously, if your B spline coefficients are going to be larger, you'll have uh, a larger transformation. So it's that Jacobian uh, matrix that we are talking about here. Now, uh, so just a bit of terminology. I believe usually people use gradients for functions and Jacobian matrices are when you have uh, a function that goes from uh, high dimensional space to high dimensional space again. And so in that means that the, your matrix of partial derivatives is going to be an M times N matrix. And that's usually the notation that people use. And so uh, if in, in, in often what we do is we, we think about having variables that are column vectors. In that case, the gradient is going to be a row vector. And so you'll have to use transposes. And if you use transposes, it's going to switch the order of the operations that you do. So again, that's something that you have to be careful of. So um, we need the uh, gradient of the similarity term. That's easy enough. Uh, and then we need the Jacobian matrix of the transformed image with respect to the uh, these prime coefficients. 
Uh, so, okay, so this is very similar to what we would be doing in image reconstruction. None of the, I can just replace notations and everything will be exactly the same. There are some issues, however, the, the forward model in this case, so it's a transformation of the image is nonlinear uh, and it's even not a fine. So that's very different from what we normally do in, in PET and CT and MR reconstruction where all of these are affine forward models. The uh, similarity metric there is nonlinear, but the forward model is, and so that makes life easier. In particular, it means also that the optimization problem is not convex. So all the convex optimization methods are out of the window for image registration. And even worse, it's not just convex, but the optimization problem has local minima. And the uh, prime example of that one is suppose that you have two blocks and uh, now you need you have you have your two blocks in another space other location and you need to register those well there's going to be three local minima one is where the two blocks overlap another one is when one block overlaps with the other and there's a third one where the other block overlaps with one so you have problems with local minima and uh, generally there are very few algorithms that can cope with local minima and you have to go towards for instance, simulated annealing and variations of that, uh, or, or possibly genetic, genetic algorithms and so on. And those are, are often uh, out of scope because of the number of variables that we have here. So how do people practice, handle this in practice? Well, they, they throw in some heuristics and they'll, they'll, for instance, say, well, you know, my, the center of mass of my two images has to be close to each other. So the first thing that you'll do is have some uh, registration or translation and maybe you have some rotation based on moments, second order moments or so. Uh, the second ap approach is to say, I'm going to first register everything at le really low resolution. So I, in, if we go back to the example of the two blocks, that means those, if you, if you look at it at le really low resolution, it will look as one block with some shape in there and so uh, if you make those two blocks morph into one blob uh, then the registration problem does become unique and so what you then do in the multi-resolution pyramid is you say I've, i register everything really first at really low resolution then i use that registry uh, output as an input for the next registration problem which is at higher resolution and you, you usually do that in three steps uh, obviously that will depend on how large your motion is and so on and uh, so that that will need some tuning uh, and the final thing that people do is uh, well in many cases you want to do some rigid registration first uh, and that you will also have to do with multi-resolution. Um, and only then you switch the non-rigid algorithm on and maybe you do the non-rigidity first at very high penalty and then you decrease the penalty if you like. So th all of those things uh, help you to find the uh, solution in practice. None of it is to find, it is guaranteed to find you the true solution, but in practice this tends to work. So. It, for for optimization people it's a it's a major problem but for registration people they just they say well we know that and we we have our 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 bag of tricks if you like and then we just don't care about them um but in any case even if you do all of those tricks it's still a non-convex problem okay uh so now I go in, into a, uh, a bit more detail on the kind of operations that we would need to be able to do this in SURF. So we talked about the Jacobian determinant of the transformed image with respect to your B-spline coefficients. That is a hard thing to get your head around. So because we said earlier that this is normally 
done in a two-step process where we first compute the deformation field D and then we do the uh, resampling. So that means you can do your chain rule thing again. And so the, that's what that's the top of the screen there. Uh, now, so that means we need to compute those two matrices and then we're fine. Now those matrices tend to be very large uh, because they are uh, at least image sized and uh, well, image times image. And also you have the three dimensions. So those matrices are very large to store. You, you could store them sparsely, but nevertheless, uh, often that isn't done. But so similarly to what we do in image reconstruction, uh, you don't have to store your projection matrix as long as you can do forward and back projection. So in this case, forward is easy, you do the resampling, but now we don't have an, a transpose, we don't have an adjoint operation because everything is nonlinear. But as long as we can uh, multiply our Jacobian with an image and need to take care of the transposes, whatever, then we can do the, the calculations because if I go back for a second, yes, we need to be able to do the SD uh, lambda, which is an image. And we need to multiply that with this thing. So as long as I have an operation that does that multiplication, so imagine that there is the SD lambda here, then I can do whatever I want. And so, uh, if I have the operation that computes this, and then I, the next thing in the chain as well, now I have a deformation field and I need to multiply that with the relevant Jacobian matrix, I am fine. Now, in many cases, the deformation field parametrization is linear. It is linear in the case of D spline. It is not linear for if you use uh, rigid transformations. Uh, but if it is linear, then this operation is the same as saying take, uh, uh, take multiply with the adjoint of the of the resum, uh, sorry of the model. Uh, okay, so those operations clearly we don't have at the moment in Surf, but once we do, we would be able to write a gradient-based uh, image registration algorithm. Okay, so now we can do image registration. Uh, what if we have multiple images? Say we have multiple gates or so, and we're interested in the problem where there is one fixed image, one underlying image, and it's going to deform to multiple gates, and we want to estimate all of those deformations. Well, for an optimization uh, perspective, it is really easy. I'm just going to have an objective function which is the sum of the objective functions, uh, one for every gate. And uh, where now, so this target image is the gate and I have one single image that I'm deforming, but I have multiple uh, deformations. <clears throat> and maybe you will add a penalty that is based on the, uh, some temporal behavior of your um, deformation field. And uh, one particular, in some sense, type of penalty or, or, or a step that you could take here is to say, I'm going to use a motion model and that model is a model for how do the uh, deformations change over time or over gate. And <clears throat> if you have that in in terms of a breathing signal or something like that, you would have a model for how do the alpha G's depend on a breathing signal. You will then need to optimize your parameters there. But again, that's another change rule that you can apply. So in, in principle, uh, um, if we are able to compute gradients for the image term, then we can do gradients for the sum of the uh, multiple images and therefore we can do optimization over multiple gates. Okay. So 
all of this was when our target image was, uh, sorry, it was an image. But what happens if we would want to compute the similarity metric in acquisition data space or in sinogram space? So we say, I have an image and I have some measured data and I want to find the transformation such that the image A54 projected will give me the measured data. So I know what the image is, but I just need to find its location. Uh, well, I can uh, say, well, I now have a more complicated acquisition model, but in practice, these transformations will be non-rigid and so on. So in, in practice, what we will do is we are going to chain this up again, yes? So we're going to say my whole forward model is I first transform the image and then I do my normal forward projection. And here then, uh, it, the normal forward projection will usually not depend on the transformation that I have applied, if you do CT or MR. However, in PET, that isn't the case, unfortunately. Uh, because our acquisition model also depends on the transformation that we're applying. Because the acquisition model depends on the attenuation map. And so if we move the image, we also need to move the attenuation map and that will change the acquisition model. So that makes life a bit more complicated if we do MR based uh, problems, then we don't really have to think about this so much. That's what Christoph Kolbich talked about uh, last time that uh, in principle, your MR model also depends on the motion through core sensitivity maps and so on. But in practice, that dependence is quite small. So most people ignore it. But in PET, you can't ignore it. So if we think about gradients, uh, things get a little bit hairy. And so uh, at this point, you probably are going to switch off. But uh, if you have now a similarity term for the measured data, has to be similar to my normal fall projection of my transformed image and the transformed new map. Uh, and we need to know how does this thing depend on my deformations. I need to know the gradient of this objective function with respect to alpha. And therefore I need to know the gradient with respect to my deformation fields and deformation field with respect to alpha. And I, this one, I now need to write in terms of dependence of my objective function with respect to emission image plus a term of the dependence on the attenuation image. So that is, a, that is something that people for a long time either closed their eyes for and said, well, let me not change the attenuation image or they ignored it. Uh, both approaches are obviously incorrect and so uh, only since a few years that people uh, take that second term into account. Um, okay so if I want to code this up so the the the, the lambda d d stuff and the mu d d I, I have computed for image registration I have those operations I now need to know uh, these guys, but that's not so hard because this is my normal objective function, my normal similarity thing. How does it depend on an image? And so this first term is our normal gradient that we have for objective functions. And uh, we can compute it in terms of the back projection. So that's fine. Uh, However, we also need to know how does my objective function depend on the attenuation image. And that's a term that in normal image reconstruction uh, in PET, we, we never write down. 
obviously in CT, that is exactly what people are doing, except that in a lot of CT, people ignore exponentials and all of that stuff. They'll say, I'll, I'll just do a least squares fit, thank you. But we can't do that because our, uh, we, we have the attenuation uh, need to see how does it go through uh, line integrals and then uh, exponentials for the Lambert BL law. Um, so uh, we can compute it in, in various ways. And I have a few slides on there, which I'm not going to uh, talk about, but which we could come back to later on. Um, I just wanted to mention that this gradient of the dependence on the attenuation image is also uh, what you need when you uh, implement MLAA, because there we are doing an optimization problem for the attenuation image. And so it's obviously the same gradient. So if you can implement MLAA and you can implement image registration, then you can do all of this stuff. Okay. Uh, so these are the slides that I'm going to skip with some more formulas on there. Uh, so, and then finally, uh, really what we are interested in is not the problem where we say, we know what the image is, where is it located in my uh, scanner? But we are actually wanting to find out what is the image plus how does it deform? And so this is a joint motion estimation and uh, image reconstruction problem. And I, uh, last time I briefly talked about uh, the uh, method by Alexandre Bus. I'm going to skip that now, but uh, if you think about it, we can it's a joint optimization problem so we can say okay i have uh, two sets of variables i have my image and i have the uh, alphas the deformation field parameters for every gate i'm just going to stack these up in a, a uh, whatever that it is, block thingy from CIL, and I'll give it to CIL, and out comes the final solution. Uh, that could work. It's going to be a very hard optimization to do. I don't think anybody in the literature is, uh, is trying this. It is very hard because it's very, very nonlinear, very, very non-convex. Uh, and therefore, having an optimization algorithm that does the trick is is hard to uh, to come up with. So, what generally people do is uh, an alternating type of approach. So, a little bit like PDHC, if you like. Uh, you say, I have two sets of variables: the motion and the image variables. So, I'm going to alternate between the two. Uh, and then you have to realize that if you know alpha and you want to compute the image, you are doing the MCIR problem that Richard talked about. While if you uh, know the image, but you need to find alpha, we're talking about the sinogram based image registration that I went through in a few slides ago. So, um, to do joint motion image reconstruction, we need to be able to do MCR, and we also need to be able to do sinogram based image registration. If so, we can do alternate between them. Obviously, the question will be how much do you iterate for all of these internal steps and so on, and there's a lot of optimization that you need to do, but at least you can write down an algorithm that tries to solve this problem. So uh, in summary, we need a few extra methods in SERV. Uh, and actually, there is only three. Um, this the dependence to so the image registration related gradient stuff. And there is the dependence on the mu map. Once we have those, we can write the three things on the slide there. and. Uh, 
we can conquer the world. Uh, the once you do it, however, there will be many, many methods that can be implemented. So the one from Alexander Bus is one of them. There are many other approaches. And so there's a, a lot of work then to do to see which of these methods actually works and, and works the best and how do you tune them, whatever. So plenty of scope for people to, to work with us. And, and just final note that you can extend the same ID to kinetics where you say, well, I now have multiple kinetic data sets, which where there is also movement and maybe there is also gating. And then clearly your problem size uh, gets even larger and your number of computations gets even larger. And therefore the, having good optimization algorithms and, and so on will become even more important. Okay, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, any questions from anybody? So uh, the option one, uh, one slide before I think. So in this case, we write a minimization problem that doing the, in the same, at the same time, both the two steps of option two, right? Right. And it's non non convex. Yes. And and horribly so. <laughs> um, because okay, you can you can imagine suppose we start off with an image which is all which is uniform, yes, either all zeros or all ones or whatever. Yeah. There's no way that you can register that. And that's just one example of the fact that uh, a joint optimization is, is, needs to be smart in a way to, to, to see which of these variables should I be optimizing now. And so that's hard to do. Not impossible. But... Yeah. Chris, um, yep. okay, okay, I have a very basic question, but um, when you were speaking about uh, multi-gate um, motion correction, you were saying that um, there would be the, uh, one reference image and every deformation would be computed with respect to this, uh, to this standard image. How, right. how would you choose it? It's like kind of mean or? Yeah, so, uh, okay, so what I, I'm, I'm trying to, to put this in, in, in sort of uh, in steps, if you like. So, for instance, what some people do is say, I have a CT which I suppose has no, no motion, and I have multiple pet gates. Mm -hmm that I reconstruct, let's say, without that innovation correction. So now I want to find out how does my CT map into the pet gates, and I would have a similarity metric, which might be mutual information or something like that. Uh, so in this case, my CT is the, the image that I know, and I need to find multiple transformations to uh, find out where it is for every gate. Okay. Once I know that, now I can stick it into MCIR. Okay. Uh, so that's, um, yeah, that, so that, that's one approach. The other approach is to say, okay, I don't know yet what my mean image is going to be. So suppose you, you, you do multiple CTs to, that you have, but you want to combine them into one for some denoising, yes? Uh, or multiple pet, doesn't really matter. And uh, so what people then do is say, okay, I'll start with the mean image, as you say, and I'll find the transformation from my mean image to my gates. Now mm -hmm. I can estimate a better mean image because I can compute a mean that compensates for the motion and I iterate again. Mm -hmm. And 
that is sometimes called grouped uh, um, sorry not grouped uh, forget the name right now sorry uh, so it's image image registration where you find one underlying image that has them all um, and that works better than doing for instance I just take one of the images and I call that my target that I deform because that one image will be noisy yes yeah um, but in the image reconstruction the joint problem we are obviously going to find that underlying image yeah. as we go hmm. yeah. thank you I, I don't I mean I have a question with out of curiosity um, I'm not too sure we have the time I don't know if you want to um, well let's see if somebody else wants to ask a question first uh, if not maybe you can uh, have the honor of asking the last question <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I was wondering um, whether um, optimal transport techniques have been applied to this problem and if, if there is a possibility that would be successful uh, I'm sorry, so now you have to educate me. Sorry? Opt optimal, which, sorry, optimal can you repeat? Transport. So I'm not sure what you mean. Okay. Um, I, 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 obviously, if I, I'm not any expert in the field at all. I just know that uh, with this technique, which um, which comes partly from probabilities, uh, that there have been some successes in uh, image analysis. Um, but well, I, I don't know a lot about, uh, about this, obviously. That's why I wanted to know if, whether it had been applied to this uh, particular field. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I'm, I mean, if you, if you don't mind, send send me a, a web page or something link, and I'll have a look uh, later on. Okay, sure. Um, Wait. I'm I'm not uh, I'm not an image registration expert, so it's entirely possible that I just don't know about it. Um, but there, there is there, there are obviously uh, in, in as part of the bag of tricks that there's many processing steps that people apply on their images first uh, yes to to make the similarity metric a little bit uh, more well behaved yeah so people the first thing that people in in multimodality stuff do is, is histogram equalization but there, there are other things you can you, you can filter them first to get rid of the noise and and all of that yeah okay thank you okay great well in that case, if there are no more questions, um, I uh, uh, stop sharing and um, like to uh, thank everybody for listening in into our software framework meeting. Um, I hope you found it useful. Uh, so next week, next Monday, we are going to have another one. Um, this will be a bit different because uh, next week uh, we're going to try and concentrate on uh, expanding STIR and therefore SURF support to PET scanners. <clears throat> and so it will not be uh, so much on general methods, but more on, on practical detail of the things that we miss, uh, like uh, file formats and Monte Carlo simulators and, and all of that stuff. So we, we are still adding a few talks on uh, our agenda and so do have a look on the website it's detailed there and then the intention is the same that that forms an introduction for the uh, virtual hackathon that's going to follow next week uh, it's a bit a busy program uh, but um, yeah that's just how it happened to uh, to fit together uh, if you uh, have suggestions for future software framework meetings please send them to us uh, i think the easiest thing is to just send them to the list and if you want to contribute in future meetings that would be 
on the show, obviously. Um, we uh, should normally put the slides, if every all the speakers agree, on our website and also the recording for today, as we normally try and do. Uh, I'll check later on with the speakers if that's all right. There are no more questions. I'd like to thank uh, all the attendees. And we shall know, now go into uh, probably not too long discussion on the plan for the rest of the week on our uh, virtual hackathon on optimization and motion estimation. So feel free to drop off or to hang on as you like. Don't see too many people logging out at the moment, but... <laughs> um, Okay, so uh, the intention of our virtual hackathon is, is to try and make some progress on essentially on MCIR and hopefully image registration, but do that because of all the computational issues and so on that you've heard about by looking into uh, PDHC and, and stochastics PDHC. And so that is sort of a topic on its own that really doesn't have anything to do with the MCIR. So we can, uh, in, in some sense, easily divide us up into different groups, uh, tackling different problems. And uh, that is how we, will, how we will have to do it. And so uh, it is going to be all a little bit difficult because we're clearly not sitting sitting in the same room somewhere and we'll, uh, we weren't quite sure how we would organize ourselves but um, the intention is to uh, try and find out from each other what topic are we interested in which one do we want to tackle and then uh, get together with a, f a few people ideally on one topic and uh, make some progress there. But nevertheless, because we are working towards one common goal, and the final goal is to do joint reconstruction and motion estimation for PET and MR and uh, whatever else we can throw at it. So uh, the uh, idea is therefore to, to get together every morning and give that every group gives us um, a status update on uh, where did we get to and see if it converges in some sense. So we are doing a grouped coordinate ascent uh, optimization. Uh, so uh, I don't know, actually I haven't checked the form and uh, on, on what people in, uh, put in as their uh, interest and so on, but uh, I think I know pretty much everybody online except for uh, three people. I don't know if they intend to join or not, but I see uh, Sajit, uh, Sajajit and VXBDBD. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you guys are interested in joining, maybe you can explain a little bit first on who you are and what you would uh, like to contribute to of all the things you've been talking about? Uh, why does Sajid start? I saw a microphone moving a little bit, but not anymore. Nope. It's possibly joint sound problems. You can feel free to put something in the chat otherwise. Um, no, okay. So, um, the other person was uh, Sajajit. I'm sure I mispronounce it. Are you still around? No. And VXP DBD. 
also not. Okay. Uh, well, that means I guess we're uh, sl uh, down to uh, maybe more well-known people. Um, does anybody uh, want an introduction from anybody that you don't know? If you look at the participant list, so there's... Uh, yeah. If we, yeah. Maybe we could just briefly introduce ourselves because I personally, I, I, I don't know yeah. I, everyone. Okay, so, sure. I mean, I don't know. Yep, makes sense. Make